Our next speaker has been with us since the beginning of Skepticon. He's a Skepticon vet. He hates crackers and he loves dinosaurs. PZ Myers. All right. Thank you. All right, here I am. Uh, <laughs> The other day, I got a tweet on Twitter about this talk. Somebody was concerned. They asked me, given the title, would it be OK to bring a 13-year-old boy to this event? And I said, just, you know, it was Twitter. You only have 140 characters. I said, yeah. Uh, but let me ex expand it a little more. First of all, one reason is 13-year-old boys know a heck of a lot more about sex than you think. <laughs> So I'm pretty safe no matter what I say here. They're going to say, it's, oh, that's old hat. Uh, the other thing is, it's a really misleading title. I'm lying to you. There's, <laughs> there's, there's very little kink in this, very little sex, except in a very abstract sense. It's all going to be science and math. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. You'll, you'll cope, right? OK, so what I want to talk about here is, oh, first of all, I have to remind myself. Rebecca Watson told me I have to plug her table out there, which is selling Ferengula merchandise. So it's shut down for the night, but I guess she'll be back up tomorrow. And you go over there and buy everything. Just do it. Just buy everything. OK, anyway, so here's what I'm going to talk about. So I want to talk about the kinky stuff. I want to talk about. Here's the dirty word, pluralism. How many of you have heard of this? Good for you, OK. I have talked to a lot of people, and they tell me, yeah, I've heard of pluralism. What does it mean? And they'll say, you know, I'll tell that there's many modes of evolutionary change. And they'll say, OK, I can't think of any. So I thought what I would do today is, is explain to you multiple modes of evolutionary change. So we'll go through the basics of evolutionary theory. And that's, that's where we'll have to throw in a little bit of math. Um, this is a cartoon illustrating the problem. That It's all in German, but it's so tiny you can't read it anyway. Uh, what evolution does is it produces this immense diverse groupings of different lineages, different species, all with radically different forms. How does it do that is one question. And if you read Charles Darwin, he came up with a clever and elegant answer. He said it was natural selection. Uh, if you talk to most biologists today, when you ask them, how does this happen, they will tell you natural selection. And here's the thing. If you talk to most creationists, they will say exactly the same thing. Of course, they'll say it with a kind of sneer in their voice. What they'll generally say is, is, this, is this is the thing to look for, this magic phrase, RM plus NS which they, they cite with considerable scorn. And it means random mutation plus natural selection. And on many creation sites, you'll see them pissing on this idea. They'll say, no, that's not how it works. That these evolutionary biologists, these so-called Darwinists, all think all it takes is random chance and natural selection, and you get all this amazing, wonderful planet. And the thing is, they're right. It's true. That's, that's really all it takes. That's the amazing thing about this. To, to condense it down to this little cartoony phrase, RM plus NS, as if it's a matter of scorn, is really silly. It means they're completely missing the point. Because I got to tell you that I have another little short phrase that I use to say, here's why we believe in evolution. It's math. <laughs> Look at there, it's only four characters long instead of five. It's even simpler. So just, but it's, it, but it's, it's an equivalent thing. When you just say, oh, it's only random mutation and natural selection, you will not catch them saying, oh, it's only math. Because math is what we use to justify a whole bunch of things. So what I want to do is explain some of the problems of evolution that are solved by random chance. And I want to give you a different perspective than just, hey, selection again. There's that, that random part is much more important than you may think. So let's, let's state the simple problem here. Here's the problem. This is a human karyogram. Okay, this, is our, these, this is a set of our 46 chromosomes. There they are, are 
all illustrated up there. Now imagine that something happens, that we get some marvelous mutation. We will call it the X factor, okay? So right there on one of those chromosomes, there is a mutation that occurs that confers wonderful powers on you. And we, will, we can be extravagant as we want here. We can say, this is, this is superpowers. Okay, this turns you into Wolverine. <laughs> as you know, most mutations are going to be a little bit less significant than that. But let's imagine for a moment that there is this superpower mutation. Zap hits chromosome 3 in this individual. And now the next question is, what's going to happen? How is this going to propagate? Because if you're looking at evolution from a popular, population genetics perspective, there's one thing you want to know, and it's not how super powerful is it, it's will this gene become fixed in the population? Now what does that mean? Uh, the question of whether an allele becomes fixed in a population is just simply, when does it reach a frequency of 100%? So think about this, you know, here's, there's Wolverine, he's got the superpowers, He's got the hot, rockin', sexy bod, right? He looks like, he looks like what's his name, the, the actor plays in Hugh Jackman. He's marvelous. What you'd expect, right, is that he's going to have a thousand children. <laughs> Hardly even trying. <laughs> and what you expect is if this is such a super powerful mutation, at some point, every single human being on the planet will be descended from Wolverine, Wolverine also known as Hugh Jackman, and will be just as good looking and have the same superpowers. That's our dream, right? Some of us are already there, but you know, the rest of you, you can work on it. Well, how can that happen? There's a couple of methods that I'll, I will summarize for you here. So here's alternative modes of, of evolutionary change. The first one is the one we all know, selection. If it's such a hot allele, if it's so good for you, you'd expect that that individual will be better at producing children, propagating them into the next generation, and eventually, given enough time, they will fill the entire population with descendants of that individual. But other mechanisms are more chance dependent. The founder effect is an important one. Uh, this is where you get a shift in allele frequency just by migrations, patterns of change. Another one is genetic draft or hitchhiking. And what this means is that an allele can be propagated because it ha just happens to be physically close to another allele that's got an advantage. And finally, the really important one, the one I'll talk about most today, is genetic drift, where it's just random sampling that causes changes in the frequency. Now, I've just zipped through these real quick. I'm going to go through each one and explain it in a little more detail. So let's talk about selection first. How does selection work? So here's, here's a population. So we got this swarm of individuals out there, and they're all mundane muggles. They're all boring and gray, except that there's our, our X mutation up there. One individual has acquired this magic power and is now Wolverine or whatever, or has a slightly greater resistance to the flu, or something more realistic. In selection models, what would happen is because this confers a discrete advantage on that individual, so that, that individual is more likely to bear healthy, successful children who will then propagate that particular gene, uh, what you'd expect is, okay, in the next generation, you might see something like this. You know, they got all, this individual has a bunch of kids, so they're all the kids. Uh, you'll give it another generation, and it's creeping like fungus through the population, just spreading, just by virtue of its awesomeness. Um, and eventually, what you expect is that you will get fixation. Now, who has heard of this kind of model before? You all should have. Yeah, this is... This is standard, simple, simplistic, naive, Darwinian evolution. That's just the way it's explained. And, and it's fine. It does happen. This is really an important process it's that we know mathematically if you have a slight advantage, it will be more likely to spread through the population. However, there's a catch here. Chance really does play a role, even in advantageous mutations of the magnitude of Wolverine, okay? That there are things that affect this that you can't really control for. And I'll mention one of them is simply meiosis. So meiosis is the, pro is the process of producing gametes, sperm and eggs in people. And it's, I'm, I'm gonna simplify greatly here. Uh, what you do is you start with a single cell that's got two copies of every gene 
and you go through two rounds of cell division. I'll just summarize by my little arrow there. And the end result is that you produce four cells that have half the number of genes, half the number of chromosomes. And then if this, if this is Wolverine because he's a guy, uh, they then go on and mature into sperm, which you can then use to fertilize women. That's all we care about in evolution. Can he do that? But here's the catch with meiosis. Notice in my diagram that one of the chromosomes carries the magic X factor, the one that gives him his superpowers. Right away, what's the result of meiosis? We throw that gene away in half of the gametes. So half the sperm don't carry it. The other half do. Now, this can be pretty serious. This is a very substantial chance effect because, you know, we are human beings. We don't tend to have lots of children. I mean, if you've got only two children and you've got one allele that you want to pass on, there's only a, uh, there's, there's a 25% chance that neither of those children will acquire it. If you only have one child, there's a 50% chance that the child will not acquire it. What that means is that your magical, super powerful, wonderful mutant goes and is gone. Nothing you can do about it, except have more kids. You can try many trials, but you know that has a cost as well. Okay, so chance is playing a role even here in a strongly selected allele. I just have to mention one other thing uh, because it's it's really cool and. People rarely let me talk about it. I got to mention this thing called meiotic drive. Uh, there is a superpower that would be really, really great. And what that is, is not super healing powers or resistance to flu or anything like that. What if, here's, a, here's our example, we have this case where we have a cell going through division producing those four meiotic products. What if you have a mutation so that all the gametes carrying the X factor have little adamantium claws that snick out and kill all the other gametes. So that it, this individual only produces sperm carrying the superpower. That's, that is a real powerful mutation. That's one that can really affect the frequencies of an allele in a population quickly. Now, you know, this doesn't have to be associated with any, anything else. In most of the cases where it's been observed, it is not associated with anything except here's a gene that kills gametes not carrying the gene, wiping them out so that this gene will go to fixation. But that's all it does. And once it goes to fixation, every, every sperm has it and it doesn't do anything anymore. Uh, this is a process, okay, that's going to produce nothing but mutant sperm and it's called meiotic drive. It's also called segregation distortion, if anyone wants to look it up on Wikipedia or something. Uh, but it's, it's a real effect. It's been observed where there are, there are mutations that affect the frequency of particular traits being passed on in the next generation. And that's a real superpower. Uh, what I have to mention now, though, is, is all of this is dependent on this, this meiosis, this produ production of haploid cells from diploid parents. And it all involves sex. And I got to tell you, sex is really weird. It really is. <laughs> OK, 13-year-old boys, close your eyes just to make your dad happy. Just pretend you're not looking. And I want to I make my, uh, an analogy between sex and Legos. Yes, really. So, first of all, let me get this one off the screen. There, there's another one. <laughs> a little better. Here's my, here's my analogy. Imagine that there is a Lego building contest, and you are building the most elaborate, beautiful, magnificent Legos in the world. This elaborate construction, like this, this beautiful reconstruction of Noah's Ark, which we all love so much. So you've, you've put all this effort into it. This is like you. Here you've got this raw material and you work and struggle all your life to build yourself up to be an educated, intelligent, sexy beast, right? And you're going to reproduce. In the Lego contest, you are going to win a prize. The prize in the Lego contest is 
that they will come in with a hammer, they will smash apart your construction, they will take the scattered pieces, mix them all up, half of them will go into a bucket and be thrown away, half of them will go into another bucket, be mixed up with somebody else's similarly deconstructed prize, and then passed on to somebody else to build another, another construction. What kind of prize is that? <laughs> but that's what sex is. Every single one of you, you gotta realize this, that you know, it would make so much more sense if you are this educated, intelligent super beast who's got a great body, is healthy, has lived to a great age, all this kind of stuff, it would make much more sense if we just cloned ourselves. Right? I'm obviously successful. Okay, mostly obviously. I'm sort of successful. So what would make more sense is I should have just had myself cloned instead of this process of sex. Sorry, Mary, you don't mind. Um, instead of this process of sex, we just clone me and then there's a whole nother generation of little P.Z. Myerses running around. <laughs> but no, that's not what sex involves. What sex involves is taking my genes and tearing them apart and mixing them up with some strange woman's genes. Again, sorry, Mary. It's, uh, you know, it's nothing personal. It's just how it works. And then reconstructing a completely different individual with different pieces. What a weird way to propagate the species. But anyway, uh, that's what we're stuck with. That's how we reproduce. OK. Now, what that means, though, is that when we're looking at these things, we're, looking, we're just looking at not the propagation of the successful individual, like me. We're looking at the propagation of successful components of that individual, my genes. And there are all these other processes that can do this. And I've got to mention another one, another mechanism that plays a role in here. And this is called the founder effect. And this is another really common phenomenon. So here's our, here's our big population of mundane gray people. And there's our single new mutant right there in the middle of them. Uh, in this cartoon, that mutant represents less than 1% of the population. He's a tiny minority. But what if a little group of those just pull away, sail off to a new country, or go to found a school, you know, Xavier School or whatever, and live in isolation with a little group. Uh, now all of a sudden, you see there, that individual, that mutant individual is 25% of the population. And then what you could have is you could have expansion of that population. You know, again, if we pretend that that individual has no selective advantage, if it's just purely chance, just random chance how it gets reproduced, that population could expand and still about 25% of the population. So using the founder effect, we can quickly get from less than 1% of the population to 25% of the population in this example. And there are real world examples of this. Uh, one great one are the Amish. The Amish are produced, they're, they're, there's currently about 150,000 Amish people living in the United States. Uh, they are all descendants of a few hundred German immigrants from a few hundred years ago. There has been a lot of inbreeding going on in that population. But what's been also going on is that they have selected a tiny subset of the genes available in Germany from the period when they migrated over. And when we examine them genetically, what we discover is that there's all kinds of interesting phenomena there. The, the Amish have all kinds of strange genetic diseases at a higher frequency purely because of the founder effect. So, for instance, there's an Amish lethal uh, microcephaly. Little children being born with little tiny heads and dying quickly. Uh, there are various metabolic disorders that kill Amish children with a high frequency. Now, it's not always going to be diseases that see this. It's just that diseases are really obvious and they jump out because here the Amish are going to the hospital reporting these strange things. Uh, all kinds of other things could be going on. You know, for who, who knows, maybe, the, maybe wolverines are lurking among the Amish and they're just being very secretive about it, we wouldn't know. Or it could be something subtle, like you know, uh, that there could be differences in how their minds work, differences in their capacity for work, differences in their, their resistance to certain diseases. All those things are gonna be present in the population in different amounts in, within the Amish. Okay, so founder effect is another important thing that can change the frequency of alleles. Another one <coughs> is called genetic draft or hitchhiking. And what this is, 
is that chromosomes are collections of genes. There's a whole bunch of genes there. So in my little cartoon up there, here's my, here's our X-Man uh, mutant again. But in this case, it happens to be on a chromosome and is right next to a Mr. Yuck gene that has a deleterious effect. This is not good for you. But it happens to be sitting right next to the Wolverine gene, OK? So here's an individual. Maybe what it means is that this individual has great superpowers, but a really lousy personality. Not that we know anybody like that. What will happen in this population though, is if there's selection for the X factor, we're going to increase the frequency of that because, hey, hunky superpowers. What will also happen is it will drag around Mr. Yuck. As the frequency of the X factor goes up, the frequency of the yucky gene will also go up. So a deleterious gene, a gene that's actually damaging this individual, can be dragged to higher frequencies in this population. This has some significance when you're reading all those, new, those science articles about uh, uh, advantages of certain genes. Uh, in many cases, there, there is a marked tendency to report that a particular gene has an advantage because its frequency has gone up in a population, but you don't know that. It could be a gene right next door that's the advantageous one, and until you do some really detailed studies, you don't know. This can be tricky stuff. So anyway, you got this, you got through meiosis, there we are, we've got our, our reproduction, and what will happen is you'll get the same setup where on one side you've got the nice average smiley gene. So this is our mundane individual with a good personality versus super hero with the lousy personality. Guess which one will be selected for? And that lousy personality gene will spread through the population. Okay, one last one, and this is the big one. This is the really important one. Uh, this is random drift. Now, we got a little taste of this earlier on. I showed you that you know, if you have a, a meiotic event, you're going to throw away a good gene half the time and take the, the less good allele. That's an example of sampling error. It's simply, you've got this, this collection of marbles in the cell. You're going to reach in and pluck out half of them. And if you miss the good one, well, too bad for that child. That's, it's getting the second-rate genes out of this. And it means that these, these genes can sometimes go to extinction pretty quickly. So let me run you through an example. Let's do some simplistic evolution of dots here. Uh, and I, I will admit, I stole this from Laura Salter Kabatko at Ohio State University, who gave a really excellent presentation on coalescence theory. And this is, this is taken from, I just, the diagrams are really helpful. OK, so here's this population. And it's, we're, we're looking at generation zero. And it reproduces in the next generation. Look at there, we get a purple one up there. It's a new mutation. Now, what is the probability that that will make it to the next generation? If there's a 50-50 chance it will be lost, and if on, on average each individual produces two progeny? A math test. Hemant, where are you? <laughs> 25, did you say? Yes, yeah, so there's a 25% chance that this will be lost. So, but sometimes it will make it and you'll get extra copies. So you'll get, here we sh we've got an example. Oh, blue and purple don't really show up well there. But uh, there we got purples growing a little bit. We go through another generation. There it's down to two purple dots. Again, just because chance is playing a role. This is a case where we're saying this mutation has no particular selective advantage. We're just looking at chance events here. So there it is. And then in the next generation, it dies out. This will happen all the time. You will get some random mutation. It will last for a couple of generations, and then just by chance, it won't make it. Of course, down there at the bottom, we show we got a red gene. We got a new, new mutant that appears. This will happen all the time, too. New mutants are appearing in the population constantly. So there's another mutation down there. And then we'll go a couple more generations ahead. And yeah, that, that red one just died out really fast. Uh, we got another one, a green one up there, and there, there it's spreading to a couple more cases. So we've added another green one, and then we can s just skip way ahead. What you get when you follow these kinds of simulations through is you'll get a picture of this, where one trait 
has spread through the population. Now here's a key thing about this. In all of these simulations, we are th not including any kind of selective advantage. We're just saying it's purely by chance that these are essentially neutral alleles that confer no specific advantage on them. But when you do this, what you'll still get is this kind of phenomena where sometimes it'll expand, it'll go actually go to fixation, it will fill the, fill the whole population, you'll get new mutations, you'll get these rivers of genes flowing through the population. This is another thing to keep in mind when you're reading those science studies. Just the fact that a gene has become frequent in a population does not necessarily mean that it conferred an advantage on that population. It can be purely spreading by chance. These simulations show this really clearly. You can, you can run these over and over again. You see the same phenomena that different genes will rise to, and shrink to different frequencies over time, just by chance. And we can put together these kinds of diagrams illustrating the lineages between them and all this sort of thing. But again, let me emphasize, this is generated entirely with chance events, no selection at all. That is still evolution. It's a change in fre gene frequencies over time. It's still an evolutionary change. Now, using these kinds of models, though, we can also ask, well, what if we do include selection? What if we say that having that green gene makes you 10% more likely to reproduce in the next generation? We can do simulations of that as well and ask what happens. And, and using the math of this system, we can work out a couple of facts. And these are key facts about selection. When is selection effective? When does natural selection really, really matter in a population? And there's the mathematical description. It's, it's important when the selection coefficient, that is just a number that says how much more likely that individual is to reproduce in the next generation, is a lot greater than one divided by the effective population size, which is a very small number. So you need to have a very, very large coefficient in order to get this effect. Now, selection, as it says there, therefore works best in large populations with low mutation rates. OK? That's just a consequence of this formula. On the other hand, in small populations with high mutation rates, their net genetic makeup is going to be dominated by chance events. All right, now you're sitting there and you're reassuring yourselves. I can tell this right this moment. You think, oh, humans, though, have a very large population. We are safe, right? We're not dominated by chance. What we see in our population, it's all the product of, of selection, that all-important selection. Um, I got news for you. Uh, there's Homo, population 7 times 10 to the ninth, 7 billion people living on this planet. Um, over there on the right, that's Pelagibacter. This is a prokaryote, pro prokaryote that's common in the oceans. It's, a, it's an important component of the carbon cycle in the oceans. And there are two times 10 to the 28th of them on the planet. You guys are pathetic, right? <laughs> no, human beings actually represent a fairly small population in terms of these evolutionary numbers. But that 7 times 10 to the 9th, that's how many bacteria you could fit in a test tube. So there's not much there. Um, I know it seems huge to us, and we have this huge impact on the planet and these sorts of things. But still, in, in evolutionary terms, we are a small population with a high mutation rate, and the gen our genetic makeup is dominated by chance events in our history. Now, this isn't to say that selection didn't play a role, right? That there were, we, we suspect, there were key events, key mutations that did confer a distinct, strong advantage of us and spread the population through natural selection. But if you just go in and randomly pluck out a gene from the genome, odds are it's there because of a chance event, not because it was selected for. This leads to some interesting conclusions. And I just want to mention uh, some recent work that was done. Um, We've sequenced a number of genomes now. And what that means is that we have measurements of the amount of variation in a large number of genes in multiple genomes. 
And because we're human beings and we're self-centered bastards, we'll focus on our evolution. Uh, and this is just a standard phylogenetic tree illustrating the pattern of, of descent, that we are most closely related to chimps and bonobos. Chimps and bonobos are most closely related to each other. Then we're more distantly related to gorillas, then orangutans, et cetera, and on to the monkeys. When you look at that tree, that's the standard tree. So you would expect that humans and chimps genetically are more similar to each other than humans and gorillas, right? You just look at that tree diagram, you see humans and gorillas, they branched farther back in the past. Humans and chimps branched more recently. Therefore, we should be more similar to chimps. Well, they recently, well, they have sequenced some time ago the human genome, they sequenced the chimp genome. They recently, just this past year, completed the sequencing of the gorilla genome. Hooray! You're supposed to be excited. Come on, gorilla genome, it's been done. Yeah. I know we're sequencing genomes at such a rate, it's getting kind of old hat, but uh, yeah, it's, it's important. Anyway, when they sequenced the gorilla genome, they published a paper describing this, and I'm gonna show you just a portion of the abstract, and I've highlighted the part that freaks some people out. So what they did is they, they, looked, at a, they looked at the genetic sequences, they looked at the fossil evidence, and they figured out, okay, humans and chimpanzees separated from each other about six million years ago, humans and chimpanzees separated from gorillas about 10 million years ago. That's kind of what we expect. That puts numbers to those branches in that tree. But look what they said there. Very casually in the abstract, they just mentioned in 30% of the genome, gorilla is closer to human or chimpanzee than the latter are to each other. Think about that for a minute. What that means is if we go back here, when you look at a particular gene, one individual gene, what it may show is that gorillas and humans are more closely related than humans and chimps. And that happens about 30% of the time. When this paper was published, it was really interesting to see the reactions out there. Those of us who know a little evolutionary theory looked at that and said, oh, yeah, that's what we expected. That's about right. That fits with all the models we have. Um, the creationists went batshit insane. <laughs> It was hilarious. They declared, oh, the scientists have just disproven all of evolution. They have just shown that their fancy pants model of how we descended from apes is completely false, and we must not be related to those creatures at all. That was their conclusion. I was, it was amazing. It was 100% consistency. All the creation sites I looked at, every single one of them, looked at this abstract, read this, said, aha, evolution is dead, we're through. Even in the intelligent design ones, which claim to have so much scientific expertise. And you, of course, are sitting there thinking, oh, well, of course, no, this, this, is, this is what you'd expect. Right? Right. Probably not. So I'm going, to, I'm going to teach you a little bit about some more upper level population genetics theories. It's okay. I'll keep it simple. It won't be too painful. And this is an important model called coalescent theory. Coalescent theory is all over in population ge genetics. It's also called incomplete lineage sorting. There's a couple of names for it, but it's a really important concept. What we've illustrated here is here's the tree diagram. This is from that gorilla paper, because what they could do is, for instance, they could measure the similarity of different sequences to each other between humans, chimps, and gorillas. And what these numbers say, for instance, is that humans and chimps are about 1.37% different. So 1.37% of the human chimp sequence is different from each other. If you look at humans and gorillas, it's about 1.75%. So we've increased the difference between us that because we're, we're more distantly related to them. And of course, between us and orangutans, it's even bigger, it's 3.4%. So those are the numbers they came up with. But those are the aggregate numbers. That's looking at 20,000 genes, or actually many more gene segments in the genome. It's looking at all these genes and saying, OK, well, the aggregate result is that we're this much different from this other species. Therefore, we're more distantly or more closely related to this other species. But what's going on when you look at an individual gene? That's the key thing. So I'm going to show you some diagrams here to illustrate this. Uh, so first of all, up there at the top where it says HC1, there's a tree diagram, and we're, now the, the solid lines through the middle of the tree, that's just illustrating a single gene. We're looking at a single gene and the variation of the single gene. 
And what you could imagine is that at the time of the separation of humans, chimps, and gorillas, this gene, one different variant, a black line goes down into the gorillas, and the blue line gets, goes down and gets dis inherited by humans and chimps. So you look at that gene and you see, oh, humans and chimps have the same gene. Gorillas have a different one. Okay, this is what you expected, right? This is, this is what the standard model would, would predict. In HC2, we see a slightly different result. The net result is the same, that the human and the chimp have the same genes, but the gorilla gene, and the gorilla gene is different, but the thing is that as it's drawn there, you don't know when those genes diverged, right? You don't know when the split in this particular gene sequence occurred. And they're saying, you could imagine that the, this, these two, this gene split into two different lineages 10 million years ago, up there at the human gorilla split, and then parallel lineages then go, went down to humans and chimps. So these genes could have separated 10 million years ago, not six, 6 million years ago, but 10 million years ago at the time of the gorilla-chimp-human separation, which opens up other possibilities. What if we have this situation over here, HG? In this case, what we've got is right there at the human gorilla-chimp. It's just like HC2. We just shifted one of the, the split a little farther up. And what you've got is there's a gene that splits right around there, and some of it goes into the human lineage, some of it goes into the gorilla lineage, that's what we see there, the human and the gorilla have the same genetic sequence for that particular gene. And by chance, the chimpanzees inherited the slightly different one. See, under these, the, the, the topology of the branching tells you that you don't always have to have the split occurring right at the, the separation between the two species. Let's look at this in a slightly different way. Okay, here's what we know. We got these branch points. The, the time between human chimp gorilla split was 10 million years ago. T sub HC between human and chimpanzee was 6 million years ago. And we look in these two populations, humans and chimpanzees, and we find genes in each one of them that are analogous or homologous. And we can see that they're different, for instance. Sometimes they're the same. And we can ask, when did those split? When did that gene split? Not humans and chimpanzees. When did that gene split? Well, we know that they were separate lines down here at, the tr at this branch of the tree, right? Because they're not breeding with each other, we hope. <laughs> OK, they're not breeding with each other, we'll say. Well, when exactly did the last individual in this lineage have both the human and chimpanzee form of the gene. That is, for instance, imagine that in the generation before the human chimpanzee split, okay, at T minus one, there was an individual who had both genes in his system or her system. She had both the chimpanzee form and the human form. And she gave birth to two children. One inherited the human gene. The other inherited the chimpanzee gene. And that's when the split occurred. And they went on and that sounds almost biblical. <laughs> OK, so anyway, you got the split going on there. What's the probability, though, that it happened at generation t minus 1? And we can estimate that. And it's going to be 1 over 2 times the effective population size. So the probability that it happened right then, right at that instant, at t minus 1, if the population was 100,000 individuals, is 1 over 200,000, which is a very tiny number. It's really unlikely that it happened right at that instant. The probability that it didn't split at that point is 1 minus 1 over 2 times n to the e, the, the effective population size. OK, so we can estimate a probability that it didn't happen there. Well, what if we go back another generation? So we go back one more generation. What's the probability that the split occurred right there in, in the grandpa of these, these human chimps? Well, it's the same probability. One, it's going to be uh, 1 over 2 times the effective population size, or the probability it didn't happen is 1 minus 1 over 2 times any. We can keep doing this, carry it back. Here's another generation, another generation. What we can then do is we can estimate 
the probability that a gene won't have coalesced, that means it won't have been found in a common ancestor by the time of the human chimpanzee gorilla split by that equation right there, a really simple equation, one minus one over two times the effective population times to the power of the number of generations. Have I totally lost everybody? Okay, I've, I've lost one guy, I'm doing pretty good, okay. So what we're looking at here is a series of probabilities that it happened at a particular point in time. We can estimate these and calculate them up. So let's get specific. Let's throw some numbers in here. So for instance, here's, here's that formula I gave you. The probability that a gene won't have coalesced, won't have come together in one parent by the time of the human chimpanzee gorilla split is given by that formula. What if we assume the population of that species is about 100,000 individuals? And the time between the split between humans and chimpanzees and humans and gorillas, 10 million and 6 million years, is 4 million years. So we'll say 200,000 generations. The probability, when you plug it into those numbers, that the gene would not have co coalesced is about 36%. Okay, what that means is that the gene would not be found in a single ancestor at that time. So that there would be genes that are shared by humans, chimpanzees, and gorillas that get propagated into all of those species from then on forward. So 36, you know, 36, I just plugged in these numbers. I just estimated, okay, it's 4 million years. We'll see this many generations. 100,000 is kind of a normal population to say for a, for a successful vertebrate. And I got a number of 36%. And I will remind you of what the abstract said. Uh, in 30% of the genome, gorilla is closer to human or chimpanzee than the latter are to each other. This is exactly what we predict. Just my quickie estimate of the frequency of 30, coming up with 36% and the abstract reports 30%. This is exactly what we expect from the science, is that there would, would be this much overlap between the species. Which leads me, I, gotta, I will end this with this from uh, the wonderful Casey Luskin of the Discovery Institute. Uh, this is a typical representative response from the creationists to this observation. And he says, the bottom line is the gorilla genome has confirmed that there is not a consistent story of common ancestry coming from the genomes of the great apes and humans. Hundreds of millions of base pairs in the gorilla genome conflict with the supposed phylogeny of great apes and humans. They might think their explanation salvages common ancestry, but clearly the gorilla genome data badly messes up the supposedly nice, neat, tidy arguments which they use to claim humans are related to the great apes. Wrong. Totally wrong. This is, what happened here is we've got a study looking at the sequence of genomes. We've got evolutionary theory, and the data is exactly backing up the predictions of evolutionary theory. This does not mess up our conclusions at all. In fact, if we saw no genes that uh, showed this, this pattern of being, dis, being shared between gorillas and humans, but not between humans and chimpanzees, if we had no genes of that sort, that would actually be evidence against evolutionary theory. It would suggest that there was something really funny going on in our ancestry, like maybe, you know, intelligent design or something. But the fact that we don't strongly says that evolutionary theory is precisely correct on this. It also has the additional implication that these results are derived from an evolutionary theory that's driven by a largely random distribution of genes in a population. It also confirms that that distribution of genes is largely the product of chance. Okay, more than enough math for an evening, right? Any questions? Do I have time for questions? No, we're not. We're, okay, go ahead. Oh, right. There's, there's. What I didn't tell you is, okay, we've got these these lovely formulas. I am presenting you extremely simplified versions of these of these formulas. We can use these formulas in reverse to sort of calculate population sizes in the past, for instance. Uh, we, can, uh, we can estimate generation time, that sort of thing. And what those all say is that, yes, there was a, you know, when you look at the distribution of genes in the human population, we are a bit more uniform than we ought to be given this long period of time. And what that tells us is that there had to have been a period in time when we were reduced to a very small population. 
A small population can't contain as many variations as a large one, but it, it's also subject to more chance changes. Uh, but anyway, when they do these calculations, the estimate right now is, last I heard, it was something like uh, roughly 10 to 15,000 individuals were our effective breeding size. And this was, I think it was like 70 or 80,000 years ago. Yeah, so we were, we were reduced to the total population of a small to medium-sized town spread over much of Africa and Asia at that time, and we came this close to just dying out. Chance again. We could have gone, we could have been, we could have snuffed it, but we made it. Yes? In that study, I noticed that in the sentence after the bowl, part of that summary, it stated that this rarely happened on the, on the genes that were used for coding. Oh. Can you explain the difference in that? Yes. That. Let, me, let me back up that, because I think that's, that's an important thing. I don't want to give you the impression that it's all chance. Um, so what we see is that when you, when you just look at the genome overall, most of the genome is junk. I told you about this last year. Y'all remember it. OK. Most of the genome is junk. And so when you look at it, you're going to see nearly simply neutral mutations. There's, there's not going to be much selection going on in there. But when you look really closely at, the, at these genomic results, what you find is that when you look in the coding regions, the parts that really make a difference, where we're actually synthesizing genes, uh, they show more evidence for selection and less for chance variation. There is chance still in play but we see clear evidence of selection for certain traits in our lineage, which again makes sense, right? That we've got these unique characters like our very large brains and our fully upright position that are probably, almost certainly, the product of selection. Yes? Uh, I heard on uh, Science Channel or something recently a really exciting thing. It says since Earthlings are just a fairly recent species, that the probability in the future of, the, of us evolving into another species of some sort is really quite good. And uh, do you have any idea what I'll look like in the future? <laughs> <laughs> yes, a small rodent. No. Uh, um, OK, yeah, there, there, there's some stuff going. So the human species, Homo sapiens, is between 100 and 200,000 years old, which is young. Uh, a typical lifespan for a mammalian species is on the order of 10 million years. So we're, uh, we're really new. We're little baby species just taking off and doing pretty well so far. Um, of course, the, the real champion in Homo was Homo erectus, who hung around for about 2 million years. So that's, that's stability. That's a successful species. We're kind of upstarts. Um, what will we become? Oh, I don't know depends on the environment, depends on changes and, and you know, chance changes in our population, things like this. Uh, you can't really predict this stuff. Uh, you might predict, though, that uh, there will be a speciation event in our future or we will go extinct, but we're talking about time scales on the order of a few million years. No. <laughs> okay, yeah, she's going to throw that. Okay, we'll wrap it up. So, yes, my talk is much shorter than the order of time required to speciate. You may wish it were otherwise, but okay, thank you.